Welcome to the Leader Impact Podcast. We are a community of leaders with a network in over 350 cities around the world, dedicated to optimizing our personal, professional, and spiritual lives to have impact. This show is where we have a chance to listen and engage with leaders who are living this out. We love talking with leaders, so if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions to make this show even better, please let us know. The best way to stay connected in Canada is through our newsletter at leaderimpact.ca or on social media at Leader Impact. If you're listening from outside of Canada, anywhere else in the world, check out our website at leaderimpact.com. I'm your host, Lisa Peters, and our guest today is Scott Francis. Scott is a leadership development specialist with 18 years experience. He helps executives to increase productivity, manage effectively, and to shape corporate culture. Scott holds his PhD in leadership studies and his Master of Arts in organizational leadership and management. His doctoral dissertation was on leadership, and the psychology of executive coaching. On the side, Scott volunteers as a firefighter in his community. He also works with minor sports teams with their mental training. Most importantly, Scott loves spending time, quality time, with his lovely wife and two teenagers. Today, we're going to touch on a book that Scott has written and currently sitting on the shelf waiting to be published called Magnanimous Leadership. Thanks for joining us, Scott. You betcha. Good to to be with you, Lisa. Oh, it is nice to see you. So number one, uh, from your bio, thank you for being a volunteer firefighter. That is a big deal. So I I just want to, you know, as a, you know, person who wants to save her house and lives in a community of volunteer (laughs) firefighters. Thank you. Um, You And then the second thing I want to talk from your bio is you talk a little bit about, um, well, minor sports. So thank you. You're just the number one volunteer, but the mental training, I just want to ask you, um, because when I think of, I think it's amazing, but I have to ask, when you talk about mental training, like what's that one thing that's holding children back in, um, in minor sports, you know, when you, when you go, when you talk about mental training and the question is, what's the main thing that's holding them back, but is it the same thing as adults? Is there a connection there? I I gotta know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the principles are the same. Um, and, uh, like, you know, when you're watching your kid playing a sport, and you have seen them play better and then things just start falling apart for the team right and you're 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 screaming from the sideline to do better or something there's going to be something intelligent that you can yell at your kid that's going to make them play better right but but they just start start circling the drain right or you see a couple a couple teammates that that they just they can't hold it together when things start to get tough and um, they start beating themselves up. Well, that happens also in, in um, leadership contexts, right? Um, people start beating themselves up. They start circling the drain. The nice thing is, uh, in a leadership context, you have the opportunity to say, let me sleep on it to a decision, right? And so you can, you can kind of get back. But, but if you're in, like, say, a boardroom or in a crucial conversation, um, in that moment, absolutely all of the psychology of performance on the court also comes into play in the boardroom. Wow. Now, so to That's your good. question, what is the biggest thing that holds kids back? I think it's also the biggest thing that holds us back. And that has to do with our unconscious belief on our capabilities. Hmm. Right? Yeah. If, if I think I'm capable of doing it right now, and that's the big thing, right now, then I will lean into it and I might, you know, I might bring that kind of energy to it. But as soon as that, that belief starts to creep in that I'm not, this is not working right now. There's something wrong with me. You know, once that's there, it's just like these tendrils that come creeping up your back and start grabbing at your performance and they, they cause you to become tight and small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I'm a big believer in coaching and that's probably why is to have someone, I mean, we grow at, well, the minor sports, they're growing up, they have these coaches. And then as we get adults, we think we don't need any. We still right. need them. Like, I, I believe that. So, um, so thank you for joining us here today. Um, I know we want to talk about magnanimous leadership, but I'm going to first ask you, just tell us a little bit about um, how you got into leadership studies. And most importantly, I really like the, the psychology of executive coaching. How did you get like, into leadership and then psychology of executive mm-hmm. coaching? And why? So I, uh, yeah, um, you know, way leads to way. 
standing on on two roads diverging in two different directions. I was making a decision on whether I would uh, go two different ways with my master's degree. Um, and, and it just had to do with what college happened to be right by me. I was in a small town and there was two colleges that were kind of nearby that had master's programs. And, and it was one or the other. And one happened to be organizational leadership and management. And just the tiniest little nudge, one was making it, one college was making a, a move and a change. And so I just went with this other one because it, it seemed good. And it, it, both, of, both of them had something that resonated within me. Right, I was emotionally passionate about both topics, and the nudge just took me that way into leadership. As a result, the way leads to way. That took me then to teach leadership at an, a different college, and to do. I was the dean of students there, and then that because I had been teaching it, I wanted to do a PhD in leadership studies, and so that took me then to where I went for my my doctorate. When you're working on your doctorate, <coughs> you have to write a dissertation. And that's like a, a long, incredibly boring book about something that no one else has researched before. And you have to get in there and do some research. And, and so I was looking around for a topic when someone asked me to coach them. Mm. And I'd never done that kind of thing before. And so I, I of course, what, what does an academic do? You hit the literature to see how do you do how do you do executive and leadership coaching and i discovered that there was some research but not enough tada i found my topic and so and it's particularly around that that one question there what is the psychological methods and and approaches that today's executive coaches are using with their clients that's yeah. what i really got into yeah. yeah i love that subject i i'm uh my former coach had that. She was a former psychologist yeah. who then got into coaching. And man, she pushed me till I cried. <laughs> Just, you know, you can do better. You can do more. I, you know, anyway, ah, whole other story. So um, I know you have a book on the shelf. Uh, you're about to publish it. It's called Mag Magnanimous Leadership. Magnanimous. And Magnanimous. So what is that? Because you know what? We've all heard of executive, uh, executive leadership, strategic, um, kindness, mindful, good to great leaders, uh, great book. Uh, you know, we've all heard of that. I've never heard of magnanimous. So what yes. is that? Yeah. So magnanimous, it's a word that most of us have heard used somewhere, but most of us have no idea what the definition is. So probably my publisher is going to X that as a title, <laughs> but, but the theme is still there. Um, magnanimous um, was first actually used by Aristotle um, when he talked about the magnanimous man. He wasn't, he wasn't gender uh, uh, sensitive at the, right at the time, right? But um, what his gist was, was this, that, that in your ethical life, you can rise to the challenge and become the kind of person who lives in this sweet spot between two extremes. Okay. So to, to Aristotle, the ethical way to be was not, he, he disagreed with his teacher who said that there's only one way to be right and everything else is wrong. He said, no, no, it's more like this. There's two ways to be extreme and the, the correct way is somewhere in the middle. And he was talking in this case here about how you bring your personhood to life, how you rise to the challenge. So, and the two extremes would be this on one side is a person who puffs themselves up. Someone who thinks that they deserve to be the prime minister because they've got a, a you know a huge following on Instagram or something like that, um, and, and 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 individuals like this they they tend to to really try and be fake, um, or they're being fake, but they're they're trying to portray something that they literally aren't, right? That there's more matter there than there actually is. And then on the other side um, is a word pusillanimous. Don't worry, that's not on the test. But that's someone who makes themselves small, who actually are bigger than that, right? And, and I think that's certainly in the province that I live in, that's very much within the water here where people, um, you don't want to make other people feel insecure uh, and you don't want people to think that you're haughty or anything like that. And so you bring this humility, but it's actually a false humility, right? Wow. It's, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that, that is a, another thing that's, that's an extreme on the wrong side. 
Um, and so in the middle is this sweet spot where an individual knows what they're capable of and rises to that capacity. They know that they're capable of winning this game and, and playing this way on the court because they've done it at other times. But in, in the moment, they might not be feeling it, but they know they're fully capable of it. So then you, you tap into the psychological hacks and tricks that, that help you to manifest and be, be that person that you're fully capable of being. Yeah. And so that's magnanimity, but there's more to it than that. There's more. So it's there layers. Layers. It's layers. Uh, so yeah. did Aristotle ever like that? For me, that's there's you know the good, the bad, and the in between. We want to. That's like almost like perfection. Are you going to hit that, or are you going to no. kind of lean to one side? I don't know. Okay. Well, and, and he wouldn't. He wouldn't be saying perfection. Plato okay. would have been saying perfection, and that's where Aristotle disagreed. Okay. Right. Aristotle was saying no, no. That's that's just too ridiculous. That's not what I'm, he said. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not workable. I can't, I can't I can't I can't deliver perfect, but I can deliver um, uh, something that is very effective and meaningful and helpful and appropriate and correct. Um, and it's it's when you stay out of the two extremes, right? Okay. So another example just of that, a little bit of a side. Um, he gave the example of giving money. You can have on one side Scrooge who doesn't give anything. And on the other side, you can have someone who is just giving it away willy nilly until they have nothing left. Right. And in the middle is the sweet spot of the philanthropist who intelligently spot. seeks out what is the best things to give my money towards and then gives very generously, but not to the K to this, uh, to the state where they're going to lose their capacity to give next year and the year after that and the year after that. So how do we get there or are there traits or there? Like, how do we, how do we get to be mm -hmm. that leader? I don't know. How do you become magnanimous? Like, is, is mm -hmm. there, yeah. I don't know. Is there, is there a three-step program? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a three-step program? Yeah. Come up with a three-step program. Traits or are there truths there we are, can follow? Like, there are okay. axioms. Okay. Axiom. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. So, like so, you look at lots of different leadership theories, um, and many of them come this way. They they have this kind of leadership, and usually it, it's like a it's a word that comes before leadership. It's an adjective describing leadership. One of my favorite is servant leadership, right? But there is there is other types that are like that that you've probably seen. So, in most of these types of theories, there are these axioms, and they would be a uh, a a truth that you hold, it might not be like absolute truth, but it is a, a mental posture that you hold and it helps you to walk out that style of leadership. And you might have three or four of these different things, right? So for example, axioms. servant leadership, axioms. Yeah. Okay. So servant leadership has an axiom that, um, that when you are a servant, you like to the people that you're leading, that causes them to also become servants themselves. And it perpetuates this servant leadership style. Okay. Right. So, but that's not one of the axioms of, of magnanimous leadership. Okay. So, so what are they? Have, like what? The ones that I've identified, um, and I'm just going to make sure that I've got, I've got them just on the side here, another video. Um, so when, when, the word magnanimous has been used in history. You find it, you find it littered throughout great literature. And it oftentimes is being directed at someone who was a political leader in a time of great turmoil. Um, and in, in a time possibly where they lost or won a war. And it's how they work with the people after the war is done. Um, and, uh, and so, so that's what, one of the big things that I look at as I'm identifying this. When I look for someone who has that kind of posture, they're the kind of leader that, that actually can mend fences, build bridges and whatnot. What do they look like? One of the first ones I think is that their leadership style, here's axiom number one, their leadership style elevates humanity. Right? So it keeps the human front and center. We're not here to build widgets more 
then we're here to uh, to help people to live a more fulfilling life. And 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 so you you know a boss who is magnanimous would be someone who is not tormenting their staff and forcing them to work ridiculous hours, right? But but just just for some extra profits, right? It's the other way around. They prioritize humanity, right? And and so there is a high degree of respect that you give to everyone else. And where this most shows up is in the people that you're in competition with, especially if it's deadly competition. So after a war, right? Oh, okay. Like, like, like at some point, the Ukraine and Russia are going to have to, you know, they're going to sign some document and it's going to be over. And at that point, there's going to have to be, you know, a, a reaching across the border and, and, a, and that will be the magnanimous people. Some people just won't be able to do it. They'll be so bitter, right? And there'll be so much resentment there. And I get it. I get it. Um, and it's, it's yet still through that. Can I see this person who I was locked in moral combat with, with respect? I don't have to like them, but I still treat them like a human. Wow. Right. That's good. That was a great example to understand that one. It's a hard right. one though. Like, like I, I, yes. it's a hard one to do that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So okay. another axiom, you want another one here? I, I want them all. Okay. <laughs> or how many are going to. You're not going to want to get the book then. <laughs> okay. So axiom number two is that, that magnanimous has oftentimes been, um, again, littered through the literature of history is someone who stands with great posture. Right. At least that's kind of what it evokes. And and what it does, though, is it's a leadership style that causes the posture to expand. But not just in how you stand physically, but it's, it's how you manifest as an organization. So magnanimity expands yourself. It expands the people that you're working with on your team. Right. And it expands the organization that you're working with. And one of the reasons this is important is that far too often people will come into a leadership role and they saw the person doing it before and the person before that. This especially happens in bureaucracies. You come into the role and you think that your job is to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. And that may be exactly what your job is, but that's not going to be a magnanimous job. Right? There's... Right. People who, who are able to bring some magnanimity, they're going to expand that. Now, now, it may just be that expansion for that is to survive when everything else is collapsing around you, right? That, that's an example of expansion, at least. Uh, but it's, it's who we are now is not where we're going to stop. Like the rings of a tree, we, we are always making another ring, right? If you stop making rings, you die. And that's the thing about this, you're expanding, but you're also, so you're expanding yourself. So you're doing training, you're doing, you're doing practice, whatever that is for you in your context, but you're also doing that with your people. And you see that with a lot of organizations is they have no investment in training for their people or expansion, right? And, and especially Good nowadays, point. that's something that people are really uh, interested in. Is this the kind of organization that, well, here's, here's one of the top examples. Would this organization pay for me to take an MBA as long as I guarantee them five to 10 years of work or whatever that is? Mm -hmm. that, kind of, that kind of thing goes a long way to, first of all, expand the person, but also let them know that you're the kind of person that highly values that. And then guess what happens to your organization? Yeah. Uh, expands. I think that's the yeah, answer. Expand. Expand. Uh, that's an yeah. in interesting because I just had the conversation, you know, it's um, a time of year where uh, salaries are being reviewed. Mm -hmm. And my comment was, I think there's people that it's not always about the salary. As you commented, like, if I took my MBA, would you pay for it? I would guarantee you five years, you know, whatever the deal was, it's more than just salary sometimes to, to, ex to expand. Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's lots of ways to expand. And, you know, for each individual, you can actually take personality tests that would show you what, what you want to expand in the most. 
right? And lots of times it has nothing to do with finance. Uh, yeah. You know, it, yeah, it, lots of times it doesn't. Um, wow. Um, okay. One other important thing, caveat here is um, <laughs> oftentimes we can overgrow, right? So expansion doesn't necessarily mean just bigger. Mm -hmm. It might mean better, sharper, right? Okay. Uh, richer, um, something, something like that. Because, you know, right. it, it is very possible to overextend your business or your work and whatnot. Yeah. And that's not helpful. That's not helpful. Okay. Good one. All right. We're rolling right. along. Rolling along. Let's go to... Uh, These are good. The next one is related, but, but this one takes some ego work. So axiom number three is that your people can grow around you. So there's this uh, one, one of the uh, ideas out there is that leadership acts like a lid. And if you are, say, a six out of 10 when it comes to leadership, everybody else gets stuck at six. And the sevens mm. and eights can't do anything because mm. you're keeping it down at a, at a level six for the whole organization. Wow. Right? And, and it, oh, I, I mean, you've probably been in experiences like that. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I think we've I, all experienced that. Yeah. I yeah. always, um, you know, many people have said, you know, as a, as a business owners, hire, hire people that are smarter than you. Mm -hmm. And, and I hire the people that, you know, I think I can do everything. Um, but I hire people that are probably better at accounting than I am. And like, I think I can do it, but they're, they're smarter. They're, you know, and, yeah. and they are going to make the company better. Um, now that, I'm not a know-it-all. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, that is, I think one of the, the challenges here because your ego for a lot of people means that you need to be the smartest person in the room. Yeah. Right. And, and you might unconsciously just be keeping other people down. Mm. And, um, and yes, it, it's the person who's, who just walks in and says, I am not the smartest person in the room. Help me, you know, that kind of thing. But also if you are a six and you've got a seven or eight coming up behind you way too often, the leader just gets, um, like insecure about that and they just squeeze them. And it's not a case that they, they don't want to have success. It's literally, they don't want this person to outshine them. Right. And that's, and that's one of the things I'm more on the dark side of things is never outshine the master because it might bite you back. What I'm saying here is be the kind of master where people can outshine you. Let them pass you. Right. Yeah. Which is hard. That is so hard on the ego. And I discovered the higher you go in the chain of command, the more fragile the ego literally is. Yeah. You'd think Great it'd be point. the other way around, but it's not. Yeah. Great point. Tough one. Yeah. So it calls right. for humility. Yeah. Yeah. So another axiom is that a magnanimous person takes on worthy projects. Okay. So it's not just a case where they perpetuate the status quo and build the same widgets that they did last year, right? They're also looking around and looking for something that is actually a epic thing to do, whether that's to start a nonprofit organization, right? Or to, to run a large event that thousands of people attend. Or, you know, I, I think of someone like, like a Mother Teresa, right? Where she just, she made stuff happen. She had this way about her and, and she made projects happen, right? Mm -hmm. So she wasn't just a nun. She was, she was a, she disturbed yeah. the way things were and, and made things better, right? As a result. That's a good um, one. Yeah. Disturbed, you know. Disturbed, yeah. You disturbed what was around you to make it better. I mean, you have to. Yeah. 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 I heard one person say, if, if you're not making any enemies, or at least if, if you're not upsetting some people, then you're not doing your job. Yeah. yeah. I but feel you like... You don't make enemies just for the sake of making enemies. No. <laughs> I hope That's, not. I got a yeah. few friends like that. <laughs> Yeah. When I think of taking on worthy projects, are we are we just trying to make our mark? Is that that's right? a piece of it? Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah. So the magnanimous person, yeah, there, there is that there. It's you're, you're doing things that you can be proud of. Okay. I, I sometimes will go to the legislature in my province and underneath the stairs that go up, they've got this, this um, hallway that has um, people who have won the order of, I'm in Saskatchewan, people who won the order of Saskatchewan. They've got pictures and a little write-up about each one of them. And I like to walk down that hallway and just say, here it is. Here's some people who have done epic projects. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, you can hear my dog howling. I can hear about your it. dog. <laughs> yeah. Did your clock go off? We have a Christmas clock that chimes <laughs> along and he has to howl along with every, so it's the top of the hour, we know. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, dog. <laughs> yes. He'll be done shortly here. <laughs> now. That's awesome. Oh boy, he's really going at it. Okay, so one of the challenges here though is you might say, if I can't do that kind of thing, then I'm not this kind of magnanimous leader. Um, and oh. I think to be magnanimous is not something that you accomplish, but it's rather something that you aspire for. Okay. And you, again, you, you don't want to be faking it and making yourself bigger than you actually are. But neither do you make yourself small. It's live up to your potential. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, do you remember the movie Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium? Uh, no. Okay. It's I don't a, even remember. I don't a, know the title. It's, it's a children's movie. But in it, okay. uh, one of the last things that Mr. Megorium says, um, he says, life is an occasion. Rise to it. Oh. And I think that encapsulates what magnanimity is. Magnanimity. 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 Yes. magnanimity. All right. So um, I don't know if you have any more or not, but my, my one question would be, yeah. Um, and if, if you do, okay. Well, you know what? I will let you tell the one and then I'll, I have a question. But what's, yeah, the, sure. what's the last one? The last axiom um, is, is with the leader like this, you want to make sure that you're appealing to the the better angels of your nature. Better right? angels and, and of your nature. Better angels of your nature. Because, you know, like that classic trope where you've got an angel and a demon on, right. on each side of you. What's really going on there is it's saying that within you, you have the capability to be a saint. And just as much, you have the capability to be a tyrant. And it's okay. in every single person. And if it isn't in you to be both these things, then you're probably harmless, which is not something you want to be. Yeah. Right. If you okay. are capable of doing great things, you're also capable of doing horrible things. And I think too often we blind ourselves to the fact that that, that dark nature is in us. Hmm. And we keep telling ourselves the story that we're the good guy here, yeah. especially in those battles, Right. And so when you're trying to reach across the, the floor to shake someone's hand who you were in a conflict with, if going through your head is, I'm the good guy, they're the bad guy, well, that's not your better nature, right? Right. So if my and, hand slips to their neck, that's not, yeah, right. <laughs> not, not, not best nature. wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Within every one of us is, lives the capacity for being a monster. Wow. And so we must guard that. Yeah. Appeal to the better angels of our nature. Better angels of I've our nature. I've never heard that before. That's a good mm. one. So my well, question not mine. would... I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said it first. Okay. But. So my question would be, do I need all of these? Or do, do you... I mean, you aspire probably to be all of these five axioms you've listed. And, or is it, it's a work in progress. I mean, what would you coach someone? Like, I, you know... Yeah, really good question. It's in this case here, because it is a leadership philosophy, it's mm -hmm. more like it is the lenses that you put on. It's something that you intentionally put on that you look at the world through. Okay. Right? And so it's a daily choice that you have to yep. make. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius, <laughs> um, he was one of the, the best um, Roman emperors that, that Rome ever saw. Um, he... In his journal, one of the first things he wrote in his journal was, this morning, 
when I start working with people, there are going to be some who are tyrants. There are going to be some who are haughty and, and nasty and, and they're going to be conniving and they're going to be, and he said, but that shouldn't stop me from, from working with them. Mm-hmm. Right. That I, I, I need them just as much as the top teeth need the bottom teeth. Right. And, wow. and, and yep. they are humans just like I am. And so I recognize that we share this, this divinity. That's what he wrote in his journal. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I like that idea right from the beginning. When he first wakes up in the morning, he decides, and he puts these, this lens on that's saying, mm-hmm. I'm going to work with people even when they're like that. And, and it's, it's normal for people to be like that. I don't want to assume that I'm going to find someone who's perfect out there. So in the same way, that's what I'm suggesting here, that magnanimity magnanimous leadership is actually a lens that you look at your leadership context with. You, you put on this posture, you choose to inhabit that space between these two extremes. Yeah. Okay. And it's a daily daily choice. Yeah. So as a, as a leadership coach and in leadership and you've taught it and you're now a coach, you know, everything, what do you fear most um, about leadership today? Who? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> do you know, I, I do fear it goes back to that better angels of our nature. Okay. I do fear that um, it's becoming too popular to be the tyrant leader, um, to be Machiavellian is another good word for you. Wow. Machiavellian, yes, it's, it was a a book that was written like 400 years ago by a guy writing to a king to tell him how to be a leader in his context. And the thing he said, he basically taught the king was, it's better to be feared than to be loved by your people, right? And I think we're seeing that, that the, the, the world is maybe really overcorrecting towards that, that that people are bringing a leadership style of terror and, and fear rather than um, that benevolence, that kindness, mm. right? And for, for good reason, I'd like the problem, if you bring a magnanimous style, the Achilles heel to this is that people can take advantage of that, especially sociopaths, yeah. they, <laughs> they can. And so you've got to keep that in mind, right? That's the thing you got to watch is... I'll, uh, you know, I'll let you, I'll let you hit me sideways once. If you do it twice, things have changed. And if you do it a third time, you know, I'm still going to treat you with respect. You're still a human, but you're dangerous. And I'm not going to let you have any power over me or my people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me, um, I'm reading, I just finished boundaries by oh, yeah. Dr. Henry Cloud. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> boundaries. Yep. Yes, I, I I felt the moment there of setting the boundary, like you know, once fine, or or I'll you know I'll let it go. Yeah, but we're gonna set some boundaries. So, so this podcast is obviously about you know the integrating personal, professional, spiritual. So we're gonna switch mm-hmm. to spiritual. And I just sort of want to know, um, can you take us a little bit on your faith journey? I mean, that's why we bring you here. We know you're a you're a follower, and just yeah. were you always? Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about your story. I was I was one of those uh, lucky lucky people who grew up in the faith. Um, I remember making my own choice for faith at age four, uh, and following in it. Uh, my parents, uh, granted, gr- growing up like the Waltons, I had that <laughs> that blissful uh, time growing up, and the church was very much a part of our life. It was our our external family, um, so very very involved. Um, lots of volunteering at, at the church, but also as I got into my teenage years, um, I also had quite a spiritual renovation where it became my own faith. Uh, I was involved oh. with youth groups and uh, some Christian camps and, and my own relationship with God uh, took hold um, apart from my parents, right? Before I was riding on their shirt tail and then I mm-hmm. became I, then, then I discovered God in my own relationship, and yeah. and um, and so then I did end up going to Bible college, 
And mm -hmm. um, at some point I realized that I was able to feed myself, right? Um, so what is like up until then, it was like, like I needed the pastor, I needed the preacher, I needed the author, someone to give me, to feed me and to teach me and whatnot. But then there came a point where I realized, okay, now I can, I can start doing this for myself. I still want those people's influence in my life, but I'm, I'm equally capable of spending time in scripture by myself and in prayer. Okay. And it's like I became my own priest. And that was, that was a, a really important kind of moment in my life. Um, yeah. I think, I think that's a big know, part of Protestantism, hey? I, the, I don't the know. The Protestant <laughs> says that I, I, that, that I don't need the priest in order to have God come into my life. No. It's your relationship. I am a priest. Yeah. 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 That's a interesting. I I'm I think I'm still at a point where I I probably surround myself with people that you know I I I mean I spend my quiet time and time in prayer, but I I still feel I I need <laughs> that little devil yeah. that's sitting on the shoulder. Sometimes I need some people just to you know I need some guidance, but yeah yeah. Well, like Lisa, probably <laughs> we're talking about like Aristotle would say. There's your two extremes. Yeah. One is a person who does it all by themselves. And the other is a person who does it only or gets only, feeding only from other people, right? Right. The sweet spot is in the middle. Yeah. And actually, he would say the sweet spot leans one way or the other. What's the right. best side to err on? Yeah. <laughs> Try to go to the angels. I'm going to work. Yeah. Yeah, to the angels, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pull me. Yeah. Right rudder. Right rudder. Right rudder. So how do you, because I know you're a, because I know you're a coach. So how do you integrate your faith into your work? Because I think some people, I mean, if, if they're not a Christian or if they're not a follower, they could actually be, a, I'm thinking they could be offended or, you know, is it more just come out in how you, the goodness of you? I just, do you, do you, mm -hmm. Christianese, I think they call it. Do you bring that language, you know, that so for some people it's scary. Yeah, I get it. So one of the techniques I use not all coaches are the same. Yeah. And, and to this, because my dissertation was on the psychology of coaching. So I, I identified somewhere between 25 and 30 different methodologies that coaches use. And I've, I made some intentional choices on the ones I use. And one of the ones I use is unconditional positive regard. So when I'm with someone, I extend to them a forgiveness and an openness. And, and it's a come as you are kind of approach. I'm going to, I'll, I'll work with you. Like I'm a mirror giving you back what you're giving me. Right. And I think that to a degree, that is how Christ is with the church. Unconditional positive regard. Yes. You've got flaws. You've got sins, that kind of stuff, but come as you are. Right. As Billy Graham used to say, come as you are, the buses will wait, you know, <laughs> um, and, and so there's, there's a big way, uh, but that is not necessarily a Christian thing. Uh, that's one thing that Maslow, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's Maslow would, would have said, that's the same thing. You, you want to bring that style. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm coaching somebody who, who is a Christian and, and welcomes it, then definitely we'll, we'll talk about, um, you know, how their faith connects yeah. with this context here. But I'm equally comfortable coaching someone who has zero faith, yeah. Um, yeah, because you know, in that moment, I am their coach. I'm not trying to give them my idea of what they should do. And quite honestly, I assume this is a lens you put on as a coach. I assume that I don't know the answer. The, the their situation is too complex for me to know what their answer should be. So. I help them find the answer that's within them by asking them questions they're not asking themselves. That's great. That's that's a good answer. Um, now I know that uh, you were involved in Leader Impact uh, prior to moving to where you currently live. So I don't hmm. think you have found you're not in Leader Impact right now. But l how was your experience? Um, I believe in your other city or town or. So I lived. I lived in a different uh, town. Um, and there was a very strong leader impact uh, group there. Mm -hmm. And because of, of what I was studying from my doctorate degree, some of the, the leader impact uh, folks there thought Scott could contribute. 
And so uh, <laughs> after, after spending a little bit of time with them, they invited me to be part of their own local board. And we put on uh, quite a few events, uh, a couple of marriage retreats and special events. Uh, we brought speakers in and whatnot. And, um, and, and there was just also that small group aspect. Um, mm-hmm. There, it, it did, we didn't have small groups like we do in some of the larger cities. It was, a, it was the city was small enough that whenever you bumped into somebody, that was the group, right? You knew everybody in town anyways, right? Um, but yeah, and so I was with them for about three years before I moved and deeply enjoyed it. And I think yeah. that's where the most rich friendships that I had in mm-hmm. that season of life came from. Oh, that's awesome, Scott. Um, so before I, I have, I, I asked my guests all the same two questions. But okay. over this interview, you have listed some amazing books and um, you're just really amazing brilliancy and like Aristotle and Maslow. And, but I'm sure you've read a lot of leadership books. And I always and I like to ask people, um, what, it, what is your favorite leadership book or do you have one that maybe you go to time and again or, you know, the one that's sitting on the shelf that you haven't published yet? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. That's your favorite. Uh, yeah, I just wonder yeah. if you have one. Actually, I've already mentioned it. Um, I go to it once a decade, and it's Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Okay. It's uh, it's a deep, it's a hard read um, because you're, you're and, and you got to find a good translation, right? Uh, oh. You got to take your time going through it. But I find that it really helps me to um, to see the world in the nuances that are there, not so black and white. And to understand the tensions that we're oftentimes having to navigate. So that's one of the big things as a leader. We too often think that this is, this is a simple problem. I just need the one solution to it. And oftentimes it's not. It's a tension between two things. Like, like should we lower taxes? Well, to some people, you know, they have this ideology that absolutely you should always be lowering taxes. Well, there are some times where, no, we need to actually raise taxes. Right. You may not like it, but there are times where you need to raise taxes and sometimes where you need to lower. And it's a tension between these two and you're you're managing the tension. Right. You should be on city council. (laughs) (laughs) No, thank you. (laughs) No, thank you. All right. So my final two questions I ask everyone is um, leader impact is dedicated to leaders who have a lasting impact. And as you continue to move through your own journey in life and leadership, have you considered what you want your faith legacy to be when you leave this world? I have just recently thought about that for just a context that I'm in. Um, there's, I'm in a context right now. There's, there's some drama happening around me at a political level that mm-hmm. my, an organization that I work with is dramatically impacted by. And um, there's a lot of people that are very bitter and, and angry and um, heavy resentments. And, and I am choosing to be the magnanimous person to bury hatchets, build bridges, you know, mend fences and reach across the floor. And there's going to be some of the people that are part of my group that are going to be very upset at me for shaking hands with that other person. Yeah. But I, the thing that I've said to them is my kids are watching. And, oh, and I want my kids to see that that's the kind of dad they had who, who is able to um, rise above that kind of animosity, oh. bury, yeah. bury those parts of the ego. That it's tough because you have to eat, eat stuff you don't want to, right? <laughs> but, but I want them to see that I had that capacity. Yeah. Oh. And so that would be the legacy. He's, he was the kind of guy that, that, uh, that, you knew wouldn't get pulled into a feud. Wow. He was not, he was not a Montague or a Capulet. <laughs> That's a great answer. Good. I, I, yeah, our kids are watching and they're watching mummy or daddy and how they're doing. And they know they can see when you bring it home and you know how you talk to your partner um, about your day and you know, so that's a great, great example. Thank you, Scott. Uh, my last question is, what brings you the greatest joy? <laughs> <laughs> Carl Jung said, when you're, when you're walking through life, if you don't quite know where to go, follow your bliss. Okay. Yeah. 
Follow your bliss. Brings me the greatest joy. Follow your bliss. I think what brings me the greatest joy, honestly, is when I'm able to be a catalyst for someone else's growth. So uh, coaching, that's a great thing. You know, I spend an hour with them and it makes, you know, major difference in their life. I like that. I really like that. I like teaching people that are going to take what I taught. Like as a fire firefighter, I'm, I'm the training captain for my fire department. I know that what I'm teaching them might very well save a life. Um, you know, oh, it might yeah. be 15 years from now, but what I'm telling them right now is going to make a difference to someone's life. That is just that, that bring, that brings me so much yeah. bliss. So, oh, yeah. Good answer. All right. Well, Scott, I want to thank you, um, for joining us and sharing the last 45 minutes with us and, uh, sharing a little bit about yourself, your, your axioms, your magnanimous leadership. It, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, I, I really enjoyed listening to you and I, I think of, I think of my, um, my own struggle I'm currently in, and it sounds very much like your work struggle is just, there's two sides and, you know, people are angry. And I, I think I, I want to be you, that person that reaches across and shakes the hand. And, and I feel almost that's why I'm there is, you know, so mm. I, I resonated with everything you said there. So um, thank you. If, ever, if anyone is listening, I mean, I'm hoping they're listening, how, and they want to get in touch <laughs> with you, how can they um, message you or, or how can they find you? What would be the best way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can, uh, find my website, advance leadership dot biz B I Z. Okay. Um, or just email me Scott dot Francis at sasktel.net. Okay. Is that advanced with a D or advance? No, good, good catch. No, just okay. advance C E. And then it's the verb Leader. to advance leadership. Got it. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Scott. And um, a great a great time has been spent with you. And again, thank you for being a volunteer uh, firefighter. Uh, all the volunteer work you do is just appreciated. But good luck on the book. Get it off the shelf. How's that? <laughs> you bet. See what I can do about that. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, we've had a great 45 minutes. If you're part of Leader Impact, you can always discuss or share this podcast with your group. And if you are not yet in a Leader Impact group, we would love to have you. Check out our groups available in Canada at leaderimpact.ca. Or if you're listening from anywhere else in the world, check out leaderimpact.com or get in touch with us by email, info at leaderimpact.ca, and we will connect you. And if you like this podcast, please leave us a comment, give us a rating or review. This will help other global leaders find our podcast. Thank you for engaging with us. And remember, impact starts with you.